Humility, true humility, is not denying who you are. It's giving glory to the one who's made you who you are and the one to whom you belong. Kate and I are just so glad to be back. And uh, we're just so glad to be back in the U.S. You know, thank goodness the Holy Spirit is the real senior pastor of this church. If some of you are wondering who in the world is this guy right here with the microphone because you only just joined the church in the last few weeks and Kate and I have been away, uh, hi, welcome to the church. And uh, it, it's, it's fantastic because actually Jess and Aaron, uh, our daughter and son-in-law, are the lead pastors of this church. So they're really the pastors of this church and the leaders of this church. It's, it's Kate and I's joy that we started the church 14 years ago, we moved down from Toronto, uh, bringing the revival from Toronto, or hoping to bring the revival from Toronto here. We started this church in our living room, hard to believe that, 14 years ago. Um, and there's still a number of people that were part of that little group that was in our living room that started the church that are still part of this church. And in fact, I don't know if anybody saw the, the little kid that came running up here, his name's Jet, and uh, he's the son of of the first member of this church, other than Kate and I and our girls. So Kate and I uh, were the, uh, we were just in um, New Zealand, which is why we've been away. We were in New Zealand visiting Jess's middle daughter, Abby, and uh, sister, what am I saying? Uh, my, my, and Kate's middle daughter, Jess's sister, Abby, who uh, is married to an Australian, and they both live in uh, New Zealand. And so, yeah, Dal, I'll get to that, I promise you. <laughs> we like, we, like, we kind of like to, you know, banter just a little bit, my wife and I. We actually, we're quite famous for it. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, so uh, we were on vacation for three weeks, visiting them. We've hardly seen them. Um, actually, it was our first time to see them in their environment in New Zealand, um, they got married two years ago, so it was wonderful to be there, and we thought, you know what, such a long way, we're going to take three weeks vacation, and uh, so we did that, saved our vacation up from last year, and took it this year, and what a time we had, it was fantastic, but while we were there, we also, for the fourth week, uh, spent time um, meeting our Catch the Fire leaders for Catch the Fire Christchurch, and our leaders for Catch the Fire Auckland, who are also our Oceania Sphere leaders. And uh, so we have two churches that are doing super well in New Zealand. And we had the joy, yep, uh, we had the joy of ac actually opening, being there for the first Sunday, opening the new building for Catch the Fire Auckland, which was really, really exciting. So, uh, yeah, we actually have close to, if not over 200 churches, Catch the Fire churches, part of this global family all over the world. And uh, yeah, it's, um, it's amazing. We have, uh, I think, 12 or 14 in Japan alone. And, uh, and so we have five in Taiwan and on and on. We have um, many, uh, we have uh, many churches in Sri Lanka and Ukraine. And yeah, we used to have Church, a lot of churches in Ukraine, but now, obviously, with everything that's been happening, uh, I think we're, we're down to 12. But they're thriving, they're on fire, uh, and I mean the Holy Spirit, um, and so it's just amazing. But Kate and I, um, we separated for a week because I came back via Brazil and Ecuador. Who knew that Brazil was seriously, Sao Paulo, a very long way from Auckland? I thought, okay, I'll accept the invitation to go through Brazil, speak at a, the, the seven nights of revival at an amazing church, Zion Church, which is a church of 5,000 in Sao Paulo. And I thought, okay, I got this amazing invitation um, from the Holy Spirit to go to this church from the senior pastor and uh, help them with the seven nights of revival. And I thought, okay, super easy, just on the way back from Auckland, you know. No, 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 it's a very, very long way to Sao Paulo. And then from Sao Paulo to go to their Zion church in Quito, Ecuador, that was planted, one of uh, five or six churches that they've planted. Um, and I went to Ecuador 
I thought that Ecuador was like an hour away. No, nine hours of flying to get to Ecuador from Sao Paulo. So, uh, but God moved so powerfully. It was absolutely awesome time uh, in the last eight, nine days. We've just seen God doing the most amazing things, extraordinary miracles, signs and wonders. And um, the Lord gave me a new message while I was in uh, Brazil. Uh, he doesn't always give me new messages, and I sometimes preach the same message twice, but it never comes out the same twice. Uh, but, the, but Jesus actually said that a good scribe brings out of their treasure store that which is old and new. And so, um, as I was, when I first arrived, uh, I was invited to go and speak at the Dunamis Pockets, which is their ministry uh, that they have in Sao Paulo, that or actually all over Brazil, that is ministering into universities. And they are on 400 higher education campuses all over South, South America, predominantly in Brazil. But they gather, they, they're called dunamis pockets. And uh, some of the dunamis pockets are like, you know, maybe 12 people, maybe 20 people on the campus. The leader of dunamis uh, who's under the senior pastor, that leader, he's 25 years old. He oversees his own pocket in one of the universities, 200 people in his pocket. Are you guys alive? Yeah, can you imagine? Who, who's at university somewhere here in, in, in the Triangle region? Anybody at university in the Triangle region brave enough to put your hands up? There we go. I see those two hands. Can you imagine in a year's time leading a small group that started off with three of you and Jesus explodes it and there's like 80 of you in a year's time all meeting in a pocket somewhere like your house I mean you know <laughs> or at some room on the side I mean that's what that's what they're doing and it's absolutely amazing it's revolutionizing the universities as you can imagine and so it's such a privilege to preach there to them and on the first night that I arrived in Brazil I spoke there on the fire of God it was a three-hour drive out to the farm and then a three-hour drive the next day back. But that night, I spoke on the fire of God, and the Holy Spirit landed on them all. All these young people got baptized in the Holy Spirit and fire. It was just so amazing. And the next morning, we're driving, we're driving back. Well, the morning we went around the farm, but the next, that afternoon, we're driving back, and I was speaking at the main church in Sao Paulo. And I was doing the Thursday night, then the Friday night, and Heidi Baker was on the Saturday night. So, you know, when you're at an event that's kind of fairly significant like that, you really, really would like the Lord to use you. You know what I'm saying? You know, I mean, for his glory, of course. Yeah. I mean, all for Jesus. But Lord, please use me, please. And I'm thinking, okay. I'm going to speak on the fire of God tonight on the Thursday night. It's going to blow up. And then by Friday, it's going to double blow up. And the Holy Spirit said, no, I actually no, 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 you can do that. I want you to speak on the fire, baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire on the Friday night. But tonight, I want you to speak on something else. I'm like, really, Lord? Yeah. And you haven't preached on it before. Huh? <laughs> no, no, <laughs> not tonight in front of everybody. I mean, so I go into the secret place hoping that God will change his mind. And he didn't. And he gave me one of the greatest keys to revival. And I don't say, like, I've got the greatest key to revival. I'm saying that he showed me that what he wanted me to preach on that night was one of the greatest keys to revival. And, folks, let me tell you something. The Holy Spirit is moving all over the earth right now. We are literally in unprecedented times like never before. I'm wearing this shirt from Bulgaria. Kate and I from a ministry, they gave it to us as a gift when we were there last November. The Holy Spirit moved so powerfully in Bulgaria. We were just, we, we were literally in revival fire. And it was actually in Bulgaria that I got the invitation out of the blue to go to Brazil. And I want to say that to you because I want you to start getting hungry, okay? Because hunger, that's not what I'm preaching on, but hunger is also one of the greatest keys to a move of the Holy Spirit. God is irresistibly drawn to our hunger, everybody, okay? It was Smith Wigglesworth who said there's something about believing God that will make him pass over one million people just to find you. 
And I don't know about you, but when I hear something like that, I'm like, Lord, let me arrest your gaze. Somehow, give me grace to arrest your gaze. Give me the gift of hunger to arrest your gaze. And so, uh, you know, when you're in Brazil or Bulgaria, and you're among some of the hungriest people that you've ever been with, spiritually hungry, I'm talking about hundreds and thousands of hungry people. You see that God is drawn to hunger. Now, here in America, we're really hungry. It's just that we're not hungry for God. Sorry to say that. I'm an American citizen, and I'm proud to be an American citizen. I'm blessed to be an American citizen. I'm an immigrant, and I'm very thankful for this awesome country. But let me tell you something. Our hunger for Friday night games... Saturday games is greater than our hunger for God on Sundays. We get, we get more demonstrative. You can be in the game. I've been in the games. I've been, at the, I've been watching games that are like the most amazing games. And they're awesome. And I've watched all of us going nuts. Yeah! As demonstrative and crazy and in love with our team and the fact that our team's winning and as depressed because our team lost as ever a person can get. And then on Sunday, in church. <laughs> Serious business in church, you know. And we're more fussed up on a Sunday morning about the fact that we couldn't find a car parking space. Oh, we had to park a little way, so we had to actually walk. Oh, good gracious me. We had to use these legs to get into the meeting. Then we got in. And oh my goodness, somebody's sitting in my usual chair. Unbelievable. And then not only that, the worship. I mean, do they really have to sing the same song over and over and over again? Yes, it's not to you. It's to Jesus. And we get all fussed up and the Holy Spirit just began to speak to me in Brazil. I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter 57. I want to share with you one of the greatest keys to experiencing a move of God that we often refer to as revival. Isaiah 57, 14 to 21. And one shall say, Heap it up, heap it up, prepare the way, take the stumbling block out of the way of my people. For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the holy, in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. For I will not contend forever, nor will I always be angry. For the spirit would fail before me. And the souls which I have made. Thank God for Jesus. Hey, everybody. For the iniquity of their covetousness, I was angry and struck them. I hid and was angry. And they went on backsliding in the ways of their hearts. I've seen their ways and will heal them. I will also lead them and restore comforts to them and to their mourners. I create the fruit of the lips. Peace, peace to those who are far off. And to those who are near, says the Lord, and I will heal them. But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. How many of you saw the key to revival? Revival is not a word that's even in the scriptures, but it's absolutely biblical-esque. And God always wants to revive us, always wants to bring us into what we have coined revival, which is that place of tangible experience of his presence, power, and most especially his person. We call it revival. And by the grace of God, we've been in revival for 29 years. However, right here is the key. Verse 15, I dwell in the high and holy place 
with those who have a contrite and humble spirit. To revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. The Holy Spirit said to me in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, I want you to preach on one of the greatest keys of revival, humility. Humility. Now, humility is one of those things that any single human being in the world has a desire for. Even the worst human being knows in their hearts that humility is of a great worth and a value. And most people, even though they're full of pride, desire to be humble. And of course, it's so tricky that you can get awfully proud of being so humble. And humility is a well-known virtue that humanity desires. In fact, humility is the posture of love. But humility is something that is very, very misunderstood, most especially by Christians. And even though we aspire to be humble, desire to be humble, we get stumbling, we stumble when it comes to humility. James 4, 6 to 7. But he gives more grace. Therefore he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Verse 8, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hearts, you sinners, and purify you hearts, your hearts, you double-minded. Humble, verse 10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Psalm 147, verse 6. The Lord lifts up the humble. He casts the wicked down to the ground. Psalm 138, verse 6. Though the Lord is on high, yet he regards the lowly, but the proud he knows from afar. And that word, hum that word lowly is humble and lower still in the Hebrew. And Heidi, of course, I wasn't there for her message, but I had a joyful experience of having breakfast with her that morning. And she just, I told her that I'd spoken on humility. And she said, oh, Duncan, lower still. That's what he always loves us, how he loves us to walk. Lower still, lower still. Still lower. Proverbs 3 verse 4. Surely he scorns the scornful. And in the ESV, but to the humble, he gives favor. Oh yeah, that's what I want. I want favor. Oh yeah, I'm so favored. I'm highly favored of the Lord. I'm the favored one. I have favor. Favor on me. I have favor. Except that the Lord says he gives fa favor to the humble. Now, don't worry. We're going to get there, everybody. Humility is not denying who you are. That's stupidity and also deception. <laughs> but you'd be surprised how many of us are muddled up. We think that somehow being humble is denying that actually we're a successful human being. No. Yeah. Humility, true humility, is not denying who you are. It's giving glory to the one who's made you who you are and the one to whom you belong knowing that you belong to him. One of the worst things that happens in Christendom that I observe all over the world is that you get somebody, let's start with a high schooler, phenomenal high jumper, the best high jumper in the world, potentially. And they're, they're just motoring. They're, they're going towards the Olympics. They're going towards world champions. You name it. Then you have a student, one of their friends, Gets a place in Harvard, Yale, Duke, or even better, UNC Chapel Hill. And we're talking, we're talking a, an amazing teenager full of potential. Maybe a musician, like, like our very own Marvin. Just an amazing guitarist. Just, I mean, I leaned back to another guitarist in the first service and I said to him, Alex, can Marvin literally go anywhere he wants? He said, yeah. I said, wow, that's extraordinary. I want you to imagine a 17-year-old spent 10,000 hours before they were 17 just playing the guitar, just being absolutely amazing, amazing on the guitar, or amazing intelligence, or amazing sports, handsome, 
beautiful, whatever, boy or girl. Then they get saved as a 19-year-old. And they cancel their position at university. They quit their sports. They quit their music. All because they find out that the church has a high value on humility. And they just pick it up somehow. That God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. And they get all confused. And instead of stepping into greatness, they shrink back into poverty of spirit. All because we've misunderstood what humility actually is. Humility is stepping in to all that God's created you to be. Understanding that his destiny in you is what he's after. And he's given you all of those skills and given you that passion and everything else. All so that you can step into greatness. Why? So that you can make him even more famous in you. But guys, I, I just want to take a few minutes before we go into how we acquire humility, which is how we're going to end. But I want to invite you in on a little journey for just a few minutes into four areas that are super important. That in those areas, humility emerges from our hearts to the world around us. Number one, our humility towards God. Number two, our humility towards our families. Number three, our humility to the church. And number four, our humility in the world in which we live, especially our workplace. Our humility towards God. Well, three areas. Number one, living in the fear of the Lord and being conscious of his affectionate gaze is a walk of humility. Secondly, trusting and obeying God and seeing Him behind all of those that you work and live with and participate in the body of Christ with. And, and thirdly, giving credit and glory to God and to those, and to man or woman, giving all that glory unto God and walking with the Trinity who is the true trinity, the trinity of love. God is love, therefore he's lover, beloved, and love. The true trinity. As opposed to living in your own trinity of me, myself, and I. Aha, uh -huh. that's right, yeah, because you know, wow. Wow, look at that, that's, that's Mount Cook right there. Yeah, the biggest, highest mountain in all of New Zealand, snow-capped even in the summer. Let me just get a little, a little, oh, there we go. I'm in focus. Here I am. Yeah. Ah. Woo! What a, wait a minute. That's not good enough. I need a proper one. Ah, yeah. Woo! Yeah! Look at me. I'm amazing. Wow. Wow, I just can hardly wait. Where's my Instagram? Where's my TikTok video? My real. There I am. Wow. It's all about me. Uh, of course, you're like, no, 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 no. That's not how I am. No, no, no. Well, let me ask you something. When you describe something and you use, is it your pronoun, Jess? Like I, is that a pronoun? Yeah. Yeah. I just couldn't remember. Um, do you use I or do you say we? You see, because God says we. Let us make man in our image. Even though God is one, is a perfect union of three perfect persons of love who prefer one another. God always says we. You, on the other hand, me, on the other hand, we like to say I. I have this idea. I'm going to this place. I've been to that many nations. I, 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 you know what I is? I is you at the center of your life. The cross is an I that's been canceled out. And the cross brings you to a place where you're no longer the center, you and I are no longer the center of our own lives. Jesus 
is the center of our lives. And when Jesus is the center of our lives, all of a sudden, it's not my destiny that I want to live for. It's his destiny that I want to live for. It's not my glory that I want to live for. It's his glory that I want to live for. It's not my fame that I want to live for. It's his fame. It's not how many followers I've got. It's whether he is able to make disciples through me. It's not how many likes I've got. It's how much of the world like him through me. It's not my reels. It's his reality. Okay, we're going to have to motor. Husbands, what about humility towards our family? Husbands and wives, be humble to each other. Okay, here's a really, here's a really challenging one. Husbands, it's your privilege to be the first to say sorry to your wife. And by the way, family, family is not husband and wife plus children. Family is husband and wife. Your children are born into your family. After all, think about it. As soon as the husband and wife break up, the family's broken up, even if you have kids. That's why it's so important that you understand, husbands, it is your privilege to be the first to say sorry, even if you're convinced your wife was wrong. Because I'll guarantee you, your attitude in thinking your wife was wrong shows that you're wrong in the very first place. And you can start with saying, I'm so sorry for any way I've hurt you. Even if you're not even cognizant that you've hurt your wife, start with that. And let it be a privilege that you have collected the most apologies by the time you reach heaven and taken ownership not of the things that you can't control, but what you actually have responsibility for, which is your own heart, your own actions, and your own words. Stop thinking it's the other person's fault and take ownership of your own responsibilities. Secondly, wives and husbands, surrender your right to the last word in your family. You don't have to have the last word. Jesus is the last word. You don't have to have the last word. It's a lousy word. So just quit. It's not even a nice word. So just let it go. Humility is letting go of your right to have the last word in an argument with your spouse or your children. Just surrender and die. And let it go. Oh, and did I mention? Stop trying to be right. Because your rightness is totally different to righteousness. Righteousness, that little eus in the middle of rightness, that's eusness, righteousness, that little, right there, that little Greek eos means the rightness that belongs to another. That's Jesus' righteousness. You without the eos is your rightness, and that is wrong because it comes from pride. Oh, goodness gracious. Parents, be quick to say sorry to your children. Ask their forgiveness. The amount of times when Jess was little that I would have to kneel, that I knew in my heart, I need to go and and kneel down at the feet of my my child's six-year-old, seven-year-old's bed and ask forgiveness for being an unkind daddy in the way I went about addressing her. And then she would say, I would say, I'm so sorry, honey. I'm so sorry that I was, your daddy was unkind to you. Please forgive me. And she said, I'll forgive you, dad. No. <laughs> I said, in English. I had a British accent, so I'd say, I forgive you, daddy. Exactly. And then, and then I would tear up and she would, and then I'd leave the room and I could hear, <sighs> afterwards, and that was enough to make me undone. You see, humility is of great worth towards God. For God. Young people, be humble towards your elders. You might be stronger and quicker, but you're not as wise, probably, and you're definitely not worthy of as much honor yet. Sorry about that, but that's the truth. You know, in church, prefer each other in love. Obey God in tithing to your storehouse. 
Tithing's not your idea. It's his idea. It takes humility to trust your leaders and, and apostles with your life and your finances. And you know what? If you're worried about your church and whether your church can really handle your tithe successfully, then be like Joseph who became Barnabas and went and found a church led by apostles. And if you feel like this is a church led by apostles or apostolic ministry, great. Pour your tithes into this storehouse. But don't take that posture that says, I'm in charge of my money. I'm going to give my money where I want to, thank you very much. Because God says, return the tithe and I'll bless you. That's a whole other message. Lastly, with the church, serve with the heart of a king and rule with the heart of a servant. Bill Johnson made that quote, fantastic right. quote. You know, don't, don't approach your life thinking, what can I get from everybody around me? What can I get from this church? Oh, I don't like this church. It does, just doesn't give me, it doesn't, the worship's terrible, the preaching's terrible, the, you know, everything's terrible about that church, yeah. Well, why don't you leave, because it'll be less terrible when you're gone. <laughs> I'm serious. Because humility walks into a church and says, okay, Lord, if you want me to be part of this body here, how can I serve? How can I give? Where can I lay my life down? Not what can I get, but how can I give? Well, the world. Well, we, we walk in humility when we trust and obey God. And those that he's placed in our lives to lead us without complaining or grumbling, even if it's our boss at work and they don't know Jesus. If you are not able to believe that God can advance you at work, despite your unbelieving boss, you're making your unbelieving boss your God. Secondly, give room for others to shine. Give room for others to shine. Wow, what a concept. You mean I wasn't just born to shine? Yeah, you were born to shine. But the most shiny you can be is when you lay your life down so that others around you can shine even brighter than you. That's when you're the light of the world. Thirdly, oh, and I just should just say in that, Trust while you're giving room for others to shine and you're laying your life down at work. I'm talking about tomorrow morning. Trust God and others for your promotion rather than self-promotion. Because you'll find that when you get promoted, the yoke will be very easy. Give God, no, lastly, give God the glory and the credit and give the same to others where merited. You know, don't take a saying, speak it out, and then pretend you came up with it when somebody else came up with it. Just take the time to say, I heard somewhere such and such and so and so. That's how we walk in humility. Trust God to right all the wrongs, even right your reputation. Now, how do we acquire humility? Clearly, as I've just been reading, you're all there going, yeah, I agree with that, I agree with that, I agree with that, I agree with that. Maybe some of you are like, I don't quite agree with that. That's fine, don't worry. We're all growing in humility. I'm only really kidding, I'm just joking. <laughs> and we're all thinking, you know what? I want to acquire humility. I don't want God to see me from afar. I want him to draw close. I want to lay down my life in love. How do I acquire this humility? Well, one day the Holy Spirit spoke to me. I've spent my whole life, guys, desiring to acquire humility. And one day, the Lord showed me how. Number one, he said to me, Duncan, why was Moses able to write, this is Numbers 11 verse 3, why was, why was Moses able to say, now Moses was a very humble man, the most humble man on the face of the earth. Oh, wow. I, know I said, Lord, I don't know. And he said, he went on to say, and still write it down so the whole world knows that he's the very humble and the most humble man in the world on the face of the earth. 
It's written forever in the word of God and Moses is still the most humble man. Because normally if you write that sort of thing about you, that you're the most humble person, you're not going to be famous for humility. And the Lord said, how could he write that? I said, I don't know, Lord. He said this to me. He said, Duncan, because humility is the automatic fruit that comes from face-to-face -face encounters with me. Because it goes on to say that God shows up because Miriam and Aaron are really mad because Moses had an Ethiopian wife. And they're all mad. There's racism right there. And they're all mad. And they're like, how come you're the leader? What makes you so special? You've even got a wife from a different race. You're not even, your children aren't even pure blood Jewish. Read it for yourself, everybody. It's what it says right there. Book of Numbers. And Moses is like, doesn't even answer for himself. Because that's what humility does. It does not answer for itself. And God shows up. And he looks straight at Miriam because she's a prophetess. And Aaron because he's the priest, high priest. And he looks at Miriam and he says, when I desire to speak to a prophet, I speak to them in dreams and visions. But not so with my servant Moses, who's faithful in all of my house. That's right, even in marriage. When I want to speak with him, I speak to him face to face as a man speaks with his friend. Ooh. And the Lord showed me, I looked it up in Brazil, that word face to face is actually in Hebrew, mouth to mouth. And the Lord showed me, Moses was very humble. Here you are, everybody. Here's a key to humility, acquiring humility. You ready for this? It says, now Moses was the most humble man on the face of the earth. And the Lord meet, met him mouth to mouth. And there's something about meeting God face to face because he's the eternal creator, because he's more glorious than you could ever imagine, because his face shines like the sun, that when you get your face on the face of the earth, in his presence, posturing for a face-to-face -face encounter with him, there's something about that posture and that presence and that person and that reality of that glory that will make you realize you're very, very small compared to him. And that actually, he's the one who created you. And so now that you've started there, you can get back up now and go be the best person you could possibly be. Go be the best leader that you could be. Go be the best influencer that you could be. Why? Because you know all the glory goes to the one that you've spent face-to-face -face time with. It's all for him. And lastly, I wasn't even praying. I was just doing an unspiritual study using my concordance, looking up humility under the alphabet H in Sao Paulo as I got ready to preach on humility that night, the greatest key to revival. And as I looked up, I came across Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, where Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. And Aaron preached a brilliant message last Sunday about the rest that comes from being Scooby-Doo, Scooby, then do. The place of rest where you rest in who you are in him and out of the overflow of your being and his being in you comes all your doing. And it's great because if you start with your doing, you'll get stuck in a bunch of doo-doo. Let's stand, everybody. Now listen to me carefully as you stand, okay? Here's what I need you to hear as you stand right now. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary 
and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Then he says, come to me, for I am humble and gentle in heart. And I looked up the word humble, and I looked up the word gentle, and guess what I found out they mean? Humble and gentle. And I realized in that moment, oh my goodness, and literally revelation exploded in my heart and I realized the greatest key to humility from face-to-face -face encounters with him, posturing with your face to the ground, meeting with him, is actually Jesus because he is the I am humble. I am humble. Think about this. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. I'm the door. I'm the light of the world. I'm willing. I am humble. There's no humility outside of Jesus, everybody. All humility is only found in Jesus because Jesus is the eternal. I am humble. And that's really good news for you and I. Because that means that you can live for the rest of your life in absolute humility. Just remembering this one thing. It's not about me. I'm one with Christ now. Christ became one with me. And he's the humble one. He is humility inside me. Now where does face-to-face -face encounters come? When you're in face-to-face -face encounters with the one who says, I'm humble, and you're gazing into his glorious face in the secret place where no one's looking, something's going to happen to you. His humility in you is going to become the prevailing posture and evidence of your life. You don't have to practice humility. Just get dressed in it. You don't get dressed in public. 1 Peter 5.5 5, Be clothed with humility. Preferring one another in love. So when you get up in the morning, you put your jeans on, you get your t-shirt on, you're looking all fresh. Just remember, what? Thank you, Jesus. I put you on as well. Oh yeah. You're on the inside of me, I'm on the inside of you. Now be glorious through me, in Jesus' name. I promise to give you all the glory. Amen. Now I know that as I've been speaking, just like in the first service, there's a number of you in this room, if not all of you, that something just resonates in you. I want that humility that Moses walked in. Do you realize that you can get dressed up in humility so that today, from this moment on, God boasts about you that you're the most humble person on the face of the earth from this moment forward? And he's cool with it because he knows it's Christ in you and you in Christ. And if you want to posture your heart in that position that Moses had, that would be a great start. Now I want to invite you to come out here and join me. We've got tons of room up here. I'm going to get down. I'm going to get down on my face too. And I want you just to fill this whole area up right here. If you want to start right now in this year, I know we're February now, but if you want to start, God, I want to be humble. Lord, I want your humility. You're the I am humble. I want face-to-face -face encounter with you. Just come on up. Fill this whole area. Don't be shy. Just come right on in. Right in here. Right up to me. Like Jess. I love how, look at our lead pastors. Right here. First people on their knees or on their faces. If you want to join in, just come, find space. There's loads of space right up here. You can come right up here. I'm going to get down too. Because this is where we want to start. Why? Because we desire for God to draw near. Thank you so much for joining us. And we hope you really enjoyed this video. Don't forget to subscribe. And also, click on that notifications button. Also, click on the links below. We have lots of resources for you to enjoy that we believe will help you to live 
an amazing supernatural life in the power of the Holy Spirit. God bless. See you next time.